When the 14 years of growing tomatoes here, I've always had at least a few knots. Although not as bad as they used to be, this time I didn't spot a single knot. None. No knots. I never thought I'd be able to say that. What did I do differently? How's it growing? Rude non nematodes. The dirty life sucking parasites. My garden nemesis. They've been my garden nemesis ever since I started gardening in South Florida 14 years ago. Without boring you with the lengths that I've gone through in trying to deal with them, I finally accepted the fact that I would never totally eradicate them, but it's more about managing them. Stack, you should probably mention that we didn't buy those, you know, beneficial nematodes. Right, well, I actually have quite a few beneficial nematodes in this soil. But beneficial nematode may not be what you think it is. We have a soil food web consultant who is going to explain that later. So what made the difference this time? Well, there was one major thing I did differently, but I wanted the soil tested so that I could see if a predatory nematode was keeping the bad guys in check or something else. So I sent this soil sample to a soil food web consultant, Alan Skinner, in Jacksonville. And we'll hear from him more later. Since tomato season is over here in South Florida, I pulled those plants out to check. I thought we were about no-till and minimal soil disturbance, and you're pulling up roots? Well, yes, typically I leave the roots in the soil these days, but for anything highly susceptible to these nematodes, like tomatoes, I like to use them as a barometer to see how we're doing. Plus, by the end of the tomato season, there are other diseases like fusarium wilt that tend to be in the root zone. In the 14 years of growing tomatoes here, I've always had at least a few knots. This time I didn't spot a single knot. None. Stack, this is huge! Nine years of solarizing the beds and which, by the way, I do not recommend anymore. It did more harm than good. But yeah, Bo, this is monumental. Uh, you know, I've had spotty results in the past, but nothing like this. I had a good idea of what I did right, but I wanted more than just my gut feeling. So I sent that soil sample to Alan Skinner so that he can check it out under the microscope. And what was your gut telling you? Yeah, basically what I've been teaching on this channel about regenerative practices, building healthy soil and supporting a soil food web through cover cropping and biocomplete compost and other things. And of course, chitin. There's one thing that stands out that made the difference, and we'll get into that soon. So finally, you eradicated those suckers. Well, not entirely, Bo. Look at what we found. Mm -hmm. And this is a root feeder. So I have the bad guys. Oh, f it's okay, calm down. The point is that their numbers were kept so low that there were no visible knots. Not to panic, because the good guys and bad guys live side by side in soil, but it's just a matter of what, which one dominates. And Alan gave me some great advice on how to improve the soil conditions for the good guys. Anyway, here are a few highlights from my talk with Alan, and then I'll give my thoughts on what made the difference. Anyone that's certified through Dr. Lingham's Soil Food Web, I, I have a lot of respect for. Well, I gotta tell you, David, and I've now been doing this really since 2010, but with Dr. Ingham since 2016. The amazing thing is, is that everything that she teaches is, is it works. I mean, she's right. It's, the soil looks good uh, in general. So I think I think that it's we've got a great start to, to work with the soil. I, I was also happy to see a lot of nematodes in your sample which is good. When you say beneficial nematode, you mean a predator or? A beneficial, beneficial nematode are ones that cycle nutrients uh, to the benefit of plants. Uh, and they cycle nutrients. There, there, are, there are five different kinds of nematodes. Uh, one is the uh, root feeder, of course, which is the bad guy. One, one of five is a bad guy. Uh, the other ones that are beneficial are bacterial feeders. Their excrement is is fertilizer. It basically, does, it's, you know, they're, they're, they're excreting nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and all the other good good uh, nutrients in the soil. Then there are fungal feeders. They would go up and inject into a fungal uh, strand and then suck the juice out of it. And then, of course, poop out other good things like calcium and potassium. Uh, then there's what that's an omnivore, which kind of can do both. I think we may have seen that on that previous slide. 
right. uh, where they can do both uh, you know, fungal and bacterial. And then the lastly, uh, the predatory nematodes, which are kind of like the great white shark of the soil world. And they are able to, you know, actually eat other nematodes. In my career, I've probably done 1,500 microscope assessments and I've maybe seen one predatory nematode. I mean, it's just, they're, they're just rare. So David, tell me about your soil. Like describe your soil to it. I mean, do you, you amend it with wood chips? Do you have like a... Uh... Yes. I've been mulching it with, with wood chips. My beds are not only raised beds, but it's the tabletop method. So it's up off the ground. A couple of years ago, I stopped solarizing my beds like IFAS told me to do when I went to the extension office and I, when I was trying to find out what to do about these, these uh, root feeding nematodes, they gave me a flyer about solarizing the beds. And so for nine years, every summer, I was very dedicated about solarizing the beds all summer long. And the soil just, it lost its water holding capability. It lost its soil structure. I might as well have been trying to grow food in the sand because it was just awful. And it was much more susceptible to uh, pests and disease. I thought I was doing okay because I was replenishing it with, with fresh compost, but it just wasn't enough. Then that's when two years ago I switched to cover cropping. So I guarantee you, if, if you looked at my soil a couple years ago, I would have been hearing a whole different thing from you. I mean, just the, the water holding capability, I mean, it, was, it was extremely hydrophobic because there was no soil structure in there soil structure yeah like when you see these little brown clumps these little brown clumps like that right here mm -hmm. these are um what are called micro aggregates and basically they're they're uh the waste product from the composting process where you have you're, a lot of that brown stuff is is humic acid which is like the perfect fertilizer but humic acid is basically composted material but uh, that the, the microbes have been working on and of course it creates this beautiful you know complex molecule that's got every element in it and the plants will use that for food but these micro these micro aggregates are primarily formed by bacteria and then what will happen is uh the, a fungi strand will will also feed on this humic acid because that's kind of a food source of the uh the fungi and they'll start connecting the connecting these micro aggregates and create what are called macro aggregates and this when you have enough of this mac, micro and macro macro aggregativity going on you're going to start to have what's called crumb soil texture and, and that's what you want because that's basically when when it, the reason it's called a crumb texture is because when you look at it, it's got it's very porous which means that it's not hydrophobic it's it's when it rains it's going to soak up moisture and hold on to moisture uh instead of it running off and so that's why it's so important to have soil structure because your soil more likely to hold on to water and it'll be like a sponge and it'll hold on to it and release the water as the plant needs it. Uh, when you have soil that has no soil structure, um, it's very likely that you're gonna it's gonna uh, saturate the soil pretty quickly. And as soon as it saturates, uh, it's gonna start running off, and then you, you're, you're gonna have topsoil erosion, things like that. So yeah, so I would say I would say in that department you're doing really well because you can see you clearly got good good uh, micro aggregates and, and fungi. So and now the one thing that um, I don't see a lot of in your sample, though, David, is I don't see a lot of, speaking of protozoa, I don't see a lot of protozoa, and we'll come across one uh, in a little bit. I'm wondering, because we just came from, as you as you probably know, here in South Florida, we just came out of a really bad drought. Our springs are, are typically dry, but it was especially dry this year. Protozoa are extremely sensitive to dry conditions, uh, and so... What they typically do is when they when they're under stress, mostly drought stress, they will go into a cyst phase. And if I see a cyst in my slide, I'll show it to you. And then you know when it gets moist again, they'll come alive again. But but if you fail to keep your soil or your compost moist, they will start to disappear. It's funny how I could have looked at this microscope was always explained to you, you know, probably what was going on in your soil. But you know you've got you know in terms of being like. Uh, maybe maybe under stress because of uh, the, the lack of uh, protozoa. I probably could have even deduced that even before you even told me. That's the kind of beauty of the of the microscope. You just can learn so much from uh, what you see. Like oh, here's a great another great example of a uh, of a cyst. Now see let's see this double wall. Yeah. And you know that you know not sure what kind. It could be a ciliate, by the way. It's just a, uh, another type of, type of protozoa. 
This is indicative of dry soil because you have uh, protozoa that are going into a dormant phase. The best way to get protozoa into a garden bed is to find compost that has protozoa in it. Now, that's, you know, the only way you really know that is to, if you, if you can do some kind of microscope assessment or you trust the source of your compost, there's a lot of uh, bad, bad compost out there that doesn't have any kind of biology. We'll be back in a minute with Alan's concluding thoughts. Besides the regenerative practices of soil building, tell us the one thing that you did this time that was so different. Yeah, and a huge thank you to my friend, Virginia Yars, who generously gave me a large amount of insect frass. And that turned out to be a major amendment in what I believe was the biggest factor in this monumental tomato season. And you've used chitin amendments before, but you used a full five gallon bucket like this one distributed among three beds. Yes, as I've mentioned a number of times on this channel before, that it has chitin, which makes the soil a hostile environment for root feeding nematodes. What did Alan have to say about chitin? What Alan said is that it is a good fungal food and some people brew it in compost teas. And what I'm about to bring up is not what Alan mentioned, but information that I've come across and that is that there are two other big reasons why chitin is bad news for root non nematodes. Number one, chitin, when it's added to the soil, it increases the number of chitin eating microbes, which produce an enzyme called chitinase. And this enzyme basically terminates the nematode eggs by degrading their shells. Stack, wouldn't that enzyme kill the beneficial nematode eggs too? Oh, great question. I read that this enzyme only hinders root feeding nematode eggs. And I don't know how that works, but Alan found plenty of beneficial nematodes in my soil sample. So what he found seems to support what I read. And number two, an even more exciting thing is that chitin strengthens the plant's resistance to pathogens, including root feeding nematodes. Chitin is also in back guano, crab meal, shrimp meal, and my favorite organic fertilizer from Down to Earth, BioLive, has a number of chitin-rich ingredients. You're on the right track because you're adding uh, some of this food that's got alfalfa meal, and humic acid, humic uh, stuff like that. That's all very good microbial food and plant food as well. When you add all that up and, and then even on top of that, do cover crops, That's it. you've done everything you can to promote the biological activity in your soil. Thank you, Alan, for setting light on creating a thriving nematode resistant garden. Down to Earth also has this crab meal and they recommend to let it break down in your compost or as a tod dressing. They warn that if it's in the root zone, it can hinder the plant's growth. By nurturing a healthy soil ecosystem, we naturally deter root feeding nematodes, ensuring plant health. Anyway, if you're like me and you like to geek out on soil science, you can see the full virtual meeting with Alan Skinner on the end screen of this video or a link in the description. And in that video, Alan discusses something else that my soil sample was lacking and suggested using organic local honey to help. A big thank you to Alan for sharing his knowledge with us. Check out his website at soillife.net or his Jacksonville-based company, Soil Life Organics. You ready, Bo? Live regeneratively and let's grow together.